Number three, Eduardo Delavos de Luna. Cartel de Santa is one of Mexico's most acclaimed rap groups. The group was formed in 1996 when members started improvising rap songs. Their debut self-titled album was released in 2002 and the song Pereros received airtime in Latin America on MTV. The group released Cartel de Santa Volume 2 in 2004 and Volume Parlabido in 2006. Cartel de Santa primarily comprises of Romain Rodriguez, known as Ron Rabia, and Eduardo Delavos de Luna, also known as Babo. Other key members were MC Darius and Mary D. Ulysse Nayet Bostro was also an MC in the group. De Luna was born on November 16, 1976, in Santa Cantarina, Nouveau Leon. He started working for his father's business at a young age. But once he realized he had talent for drawing, he pursued a career as a tattoo artist. In his early 20s, he met his friends who introduced him to hip-hop. After forming Cartel de Santa in the late 90s, Delilah lived the hardcore rap lifestyle. He was linked to gangs and drug traffickers. On March 30th, 2007, Delilah learned that the group's driver, Juan Miguel Chavez, was coming to his house in Santa Cantarina to settle a dispute. DeLuna prepared by arming himself with a 38 caliber revolver. When Chavez arrived, DeLuna flashed the gun. Then shots rang out. DeLuna fired off several shots. One of his shots hit Chavez in the leg. Another shot ricocheted off the floor and hit DeLuna's bandmate, 26-year-old Ulysse Nayib Bonastrono, killing him. De Luna turned himself in to the police. His lawyers told the authorities that the shooting was accidental and in self-defense. Nevertheless, the rapper was looking at 25 to 40 years in prison for aggravated murder. After he was arrested, he was held in prison. During his prison time, prison officials accused him of bringing contraband cell phones into the prison. Guards punished him by sending him into an unventilated room where the lights were on 24 hours a day. This treatment caused him to lose track of time. De Luna only spent nine months in prison, then his label, Sony Music, allegedly paid 130,000 peso bond to have him released. 130,000 pesos is about 7,500 US dollars. After serving his time, De Luna continued to make music and perform live. Cartel de Santa released his fourth album in November 2008. The song Cosa de la Vida appeared on the album detailing his feud with Chavez and the death of his fellow MC. Between 2010 and 2016, Cartel de Santa released three more albums. The latter album reached gold and platinum status in Mexico. In October 2021, controversy struck the group again as frequent collaborator Cesar El Millionero Renato was charged with homicide. On July 15, 2021, a 29-year-old man was beaten to death. Renato's lawyers claimed he was innocent. He was released after spending three months in prison. In 2023, Eduardo Davalos de Luna made more headlines when an intimate video was leaked from his OnlyFans site. Despite the controversy, Cartel de Santa remains incredibly popular. At the time of this video, they have over 12.5 million YouTube subscribers. Number 2. Raymond Henry Muller Cedric Gang Nong was an active member of Montreal's rock scene. With long hair and a beard, Gang Nong looked the part of a pirate. He became known for playing in pirate-themed rock bands. One of these earlier pirate-themed bands was Amanda and the Mad Men, which only lasted a few months. Gagnon then went on to join Pirates, a band described as a collective of musicians performed in bars in Montreal, pirate-themed festivals, and often practiced underneath an overpass on Van Horn Avenue. During his stint in Pirates, the 39-year-old Gagnon started performing with 51-year-old Raymond Mueller. Mueller had his own quirky lifestyle. He had lived a nomadic lifestyle, living in a green bus with his wife and four children. 
By 2016, Mueller and his wife had been married for about 16 years. Twelve of them had been spent on the bus. The children range in age from 13 years old to 10 months. They were self-educated and traveled across the country. The family got by on Mueller's earnings for playing music. Mueller had no criminal record, but he did leave police on a chase in the Abitibi region of Quebec. When he was pulled over, he told the police he was rushing his child to a hospital in Montreal over a heart condition. He pleaded guilty to dangerous driving and evading police. The judge believed his intentions were good and gave him an absolute discharge. Mueller joined pirates when he arrived in Montreal a few years after the chase. Mueller and Gagnon had known each other for several years, but by the summer of 2018, the two were not getting along. During the summer of 2018, the men were sharing an apartment. Mueller's wife had left him and took the children to Ontario. Tensions were escalating between Gagnon and Mueller over their positions of pirates. Gagnon thought that Mueller was a freeloader and wanted him out of the band. The musicians played in separate rooms during practice. On July 3, 2018, Mueller found himself locked out of the apartment. He tried reaching Gagnon, but he wouldn't return his calls or texts, so he ended up sleeping in a park. The next day, Mueller managed to get into the apartment. He found Cedric Gagnon sleeping on the couch. He struck him in the head with a bass guitar multiple times, killing the 39-year-old musician. Now faced with the task of disposing the body, Mueller dismembered Gagnon's body in the bathtub. He then stashed the body parts in a freezer. He then placed the body parts in boxes and bags. He then placed the boxes and bags in three dumpsters. Sanitation workers collected the body parts during pickup day. Mueller also took some of the remains to a garbage dump. Gagnon's friends and family noticed he was missing. A female friend attempted to report Gagnon missing, but the police didn't take it seriously. Gagnon's family reported him missing on August 24th. Since the members of Pirates didn't know what happened to Gagnon, they made jokes about it. During a pirate-themed festival in Kingston, Ontario, the members jokingly asked Mueller if he had killed Gagnon. To that festival, Mueller had brought the bass he used to kill Gagnon. He was going to use it in his performance, but he discovered there was a crack in the neck. The police started their investigation with no leads. Then on August 30th, the police went to Mueller's apartment. They found him in the bathtub filled with bloody water. He had cut his arms in an attempt to die by suicide. Mueller left a note saying he was taking his own life and admitted to killing Gignal. He was rushed to the hospital and survived. The police questioned Mueller from his hospital bed. He confessed to murdering Gignal. Mueller later recanted this, saying the officer had coerced him into confessing. Even though Gignal's remains had not been found, the Montreal police charged Mueller with first-degree murder and indignities to a body. Raymond Mueller went to trial in April 2021. But after a week of deliberation, the jury couldn't reach a verdict and the case was declared a mistrial. They had trouble making a unanimous decision because no body, not even parts of Gagnon, had been found. Also, Gagnon's friends testified that the musician was experiencing suicidal thoughts. Mueller was tried again in late 2021. This time, the jury took nine days to deliberate. They based their arguments on the confession. Mueller claimed that the confession was a song he had written. He said the song, A Murder Ballad in the Vein of Tom Waits, was meant to create awareness for Gagnon's disappearance. On March 25th, the jury found Mueller guilty of first degree murder. Raymond Mueller was given an automatic life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years and an extra five years for indignities to a human body. The sentence brought closure to many of Cedric Gagnon's friends and family. One of Gagnon's friends said that his favorite song was Psycho Killer by the Talking Heads. The friend said, the irony does not escape me. At the time of this recording, Cedric Gagnon's remains have not been found. Number 1. Varifikernes 
Black metal is one of Norway's most significant cultural exports. The music, a subgenre of heavy metal, focuses on overtly satanic themes. Early bands of the genre, who are not Norwegian, like Venom and Merciful Fate, pair their music with over-the-top theatrics to push metal in a more extreme direction. However, there's a certain tongue-in-cheek charm with those bands. Listeners knew the bands weren't really the ghouls they portrayed. It wasn't until the second wave of black metal bands in the early 90s that took the theatrics to another, and sometimes, criminal level. During this era, bands wore corpse paint and recorded lo-fi, atmospheric music. However, church burnings, suicides, and murder would capture the world's attention, and Norwegian bands were at the center of that movement. The most controversial black metal band, by far, was Mayhem. Mayhem was originally founded by Jorn Streberud, also known as Necro Butcher, in Yentel Mannheim. Their original name was Musta, a Finnish word for black. The band changed their name to Mayhem, a nod to the Venom song, Mayhem with Mercy, after Aisden Orshad, known as Euronymous, joined as guitarist. The band used session members as vocalists for their early demo and EP releases. Mayhem added Pur Olin, known as Dead, as a vocalist, and Jan Blomberg, known as Hellhammer, as a drummer, in 1988. Olin sang in the band until 1991. On April 8, 1991, 22-year-old Pur Olin slit his wrist and fatally shot himself in the head with a shotgun in a house that several band members shared. Orshat found his body. Before calling the police, Orshat took pictures of Olin's dead body and fragments of his skull. Some believe that Olin took his life because Norway's black metal scene had become too trendy, and others believed he suffered from depression. A photo of Olin's corpse appeared on Mayhem's live bootleg Dawn of the Black Hearts. Orshad also apparently made a necklace from the skull fragments. In the wake of Olin's death, Orshad opened a record star called Halvad, which is Norwegian for Hell, in Oslo in mid 1991. The store was a business where Orshak could sell and distribute music from like minded musicians and his label, Death Like Silence Productions. Helvat became the unofficial headquarters for the Norwegian black metal scene, with Orshak serving as the unofficial scene leader. The black metal figures hanging around Helvat were known as the Black Circle. May believe that the Black Circle was a group of militant Satanists. Christian Farg Vikernes was one figure that hung around Helvet. He said the claims about the Black Circle being a group of militant Satanists were nonsense and never existed. According to Vikernes, he started his first band around 1988 or 1989. Vikernes used role-playing games like Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and books by J.R.R. Tolkien as influences in the lyrics of his early work. After bouncing around with a few projects and bands, Vikernes founded his own band, Burzum. Vikernes said the idea was to make more personal music. He wanted to avoid the rock and roll cliches of sex and money. Instead, he wanted to create an experiment with magic and an alternative universe. Vikernes dubbed himself Kjell Grishnak. Burzum's debut album was released on Orshad's Death Like Silence Productions in January 1992. According to Vikernish, Orshad borrowed money to pay for the record's production. When the record sold well, Orshad kept the money to pay off bills instead of paying Vikernis. Around 1992, Norway's black metal scene pushed past aggressive music to a wave of arson that shocked the nation. Between 1992 and 1996, about 50 Christian churches in Norway were set ablaze. Many of these churches were hundreds of years old and had been tourist destinations. The members of the black metal community, who had strong satanic and pagan beliefs, wanted to retaliate against Christianity's hold on the nation. Members of several black metal bands, such as Vikernes and Orshad, were involved in the Yarsons. It's believed that Vikernes was the ringleader regarding the church burnings. One of the churches, the Fantoff Stace Church, appeared on Mayhem's album, the mysterious Dom Sinatis. Vikernes had joined the band as a basis for the recording of the album. 
but in early 1993, tensions were building between Vikernes and Orshad. Orshad decided to shut down his record store because of all the negative media attention the scene had received over the church burnings. According to Vikernes, members of the scene were starting to see that Orshad was not a main character in a hardcore metal scene. Vikernes also stated that Orshad was planning to kill him. Vikernes claims that Orshad planned on tasing him with a stun gun and torturing him to death while filming it. After all, this was the guy who found his friend and bandmate after he had killed himself, collected a piece of his skull, took photos of his dead body, and then used it on a bootleg album cover. In August 1993, Orshad requested Vikernes come to his apartment in Oslo to sign a contract. Vikernes agreed to meet, suspecting Orshad intended to kill him. Joined by Mayhem guitarist Snor Blackthorn Rauch, Vikernes arrived at Orshad's apartment around 3 or 4 a.m. When Orshad buzzed Vikernes in, he went into the apartment alone. A physical altercation ensued, but what exactly happened is unclear. Vikernes claims that Orshad kicked him and came at him with a knife and then a gun. Vikernes said he defended himself with a 5-inch pocket knife. Orshad ran out of the apartment and Vikernes chased him. Vikernes ended up stabbing 25-year-old Orstein Arstad 23 times. Rauch watched the murder in shock. Vikernes then fled the scene with Rauch. The next day, the authorities brought Vikernes in for questioning. He gave them an alibi regarding his whereabouts on that night. Authorities then questioned Rauch. He broke down and admitted to being at the crime scene. According to Vikernes, Rauch was so distraught that the police had to wait a few hours for him to compose himself and give a statement. In May 1994, Vikernes was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 21 years in prison, the longest sentence for a crime in Norway. He was also convicted of three church burnings and stealing and storing over 330 pounds of explosives. Mark Vikernes maintained his innocence. He claims that the evidence used against him was fabricated and the Norwegian court system was trying to make an example of him. Rauch was sentenced to eight years of prison for being an accomplice. During his imprisonment, Vikernes continued to write and record music for Burzum until he put the band on temporary hiatus in 2000. Vikernes also wrote books and magazine articles for neo-Nazi magazines. Although Vikernes doesn't consider himself a Nazi, he promotes odalism, an ideology where white Europeans should readopt native European values. In 2007, while still in prison, he married, and thanks to conjugal visits, his wife had two children. Vikernes was released from prison on May 22, 2009, after serving 15 of his 21-year sentence. After his release, he moved to France with his wife and children. In subsequent years, he restarted Burzum and continued releasing material. Four years after his release, in July 2013, he and his wife were arrested in their home in France after police suspected they were planning a terrorist attack. However, he was released shortly afterward due to a lack of evidence. In 2019, controversy followed Vikernes again as his YouTube channel was banned. The company have made sweeping changes to the platform, booting members who promote conspiracy theories and white nationalism. Barzum's latest album, Theolon Mysteries, was released in 2020. Meanwhile, Aisden Orstadt's former band, Mayhem, continued despite his death. Having gone through numerous lineup changes, the band still records and releases albums. Their latest album, Damon, was released in 2019. They plan to tour in North America in the autumn of 2023. Orshat's murder and the church arsons have been widely documented. Mainstream media outlets and the heavy metal press have covered the Norwegian black metal scene extensively. Michael Monaghan and Diedrich Sutherland's seminal book about the early Norwegian black metal scene, Lords of Chaos, was published in 1998. The book was adapted into a film of the same name in 2017. Many other documentaries have examined black metal's influence on heavy metal. 
Black metal as a genre has a global reach and many bands worldwide perform music that was popularized in Norway. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.